the art of yes. Interview with Jerome Bernard. Hello, Jill. Nice to see you. Hello. How are you? Good. And nice to see you back in Warsaw as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, uh, I'm so happy to talk to you because uh, this, this project, as I mentioned uh, before, it makes uh, me, uh, it gives us time to spend a little bit of uh, time together and to have uh, a nice talk and to go deeper than usually we can do that on the festivals and other meetings. So welcome to Warsaw. Jill Bernard is my guest today. <laughs> um, Jill, you are from uh, Minneapolis, from Minnesota. Uh, so yes. I wanted to ask you, uh, how did you start to uh, improvise? Because many of my guests were, you know, starting acting in the school. Some, uh, some were connected to acting before. How was your start and how old you were and uh, how did it start? That was true for me too. I was studying theater at the University of Minnesota. And a classmate said, hey, you're funny. You should come audition for this, for this improv show, Comedy Sports. I had never seen improv, but I went to watch one show. It was terrible. But I was like, oh, that seems fun and easy. So I went and I auditioned the next day. And I got in. And that was my path ever since. Back then, I mean, this was 1993. Mm-hmm. In, in Minneapolis, you didn't have to have any training because there was not really any training. So you just kind of got trained on the job. And uh, yeah, that was the start. So was it easy? <laughs> it was harder than I thought. Like, <laughs> I, uh, they made it look easy, but it was harder than I thought. Um, and I, we were all coming up together, like the comedy sports in Minneapolis was only one or two years old at that time, maybe, maybe three years old. And so we all kind of grew up, we all kind of grew up together and learned how to do more sophisticated work. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. So you were at the very beginning there, right? Uh, Not the very, very beginning, but yeah, within. But pretty early. Yeah, three years or so. Mm -hmm. So what was the most challenging thing back then? What, what was it? Like, what was challenge, you know, like? Yeah, I think oh, when I started, I had the same misconception that many people do that improv is about being funny. Mm -hmm. I think I was overly concerned about whether the audience found me funny. So I was spending a lot of energy toward the audience instead of at my scene partner. And that makes it hard to hold a scene together. You mm -hmm. know, if you're, <laughs> if it's more important to you, if those people are finding you funny than if you're building something together with your partner. I think that was a long struggle at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, um, talking about comedy sports, that's pretty interesting because uh, it, I think it's mixed sometimes with theater sports, which is a different route. So, if you could, uh, we talked about it before once, so I yeah. know a bit. <laughs> <laughs> And the comedy sports pretty long. So if you could like shortly explain what's the difference be between Keith Johnstonian theater sports and comedy sports, which is a root from America. I don't know if it comes from Viola or where, where is the root from? It, uh, when Dick Chudnow is the man in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the middle of the United States who started comedy sports. He and his team were competing in theater sports mm -hmm. and they would go up to Canada and participate in the events. And one year, 1984, the theater sports people said to them, what you're doing is not theater sports. It's too like wacky, yuck, 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 goofy. You know how Johnstone always says, no showbiz right? Comedy sports, like it's in the name. Comedy is so important in comedy sports that uh, it's even been called comprovisation 
wow. where the improvisation is not even as important as the comedy. Mm -hmm. So, so it just, it started as theater sports and then just kind of drifted off. Uh, if you know the movie Airplane, uh, Dick Chudnow is one of the co-authors of the movie Airplane and Spy Hard 2. And that sort of explains his comedy. It's more screwball, slapstick, goofy, puns. Uh, whereas theater sports, I think, is it has in the name theater. Like sometimes in theater sports, you're building something. And it's more important that it be improvisational comedy sports was very interested in making the show polished mm -hmm. like it will look a certain way uh it will be codified whereas i think sometimes depending what city you're in obviously theater sports can have a freer feeling where it's not as regulated what will happen in the course of a match uh, so yeah they just kind of drifted away so the games to me, it was really funny to start in comedy sports and then work backwards to Keith Johnstone because so many times a game I knew, the only difference in the way Johnstone described it was the intention, how you're using the game, what the purpose of it is, what the focus is. In comedy sports, it's always to be fast and funny, <laughs> whereas that's not ever Keith Johnstone's intention. Uh, right, I think I read Impro for the first time in maybe 1994 or five when I was about three years into my improv journey. I think I must have gone to the library or tried to learn more. And it was so fascinating to see how, how the games had evolved in mm -hmm. comedy sports use for the purpose of comedy. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, what happened next? Because you do not only, you, you do comedy sports still, uh, but you do a lot of other stuff. So how this evolved? What was your next experience or, you know, your way? Where did you go? What, what who was your teacher? How did you learn more? <laughs> yeah, comedy sports. I still perform in comedy sports. And I think about I want to say 2000 or 2002, we started performing. I met, I met some other people who were doing a sketch comedy show and they also had improvisation in it. Uh, this kind of uh, points at the role of women in improv. They had one woman in the troupe and she wanted to, to quit. So they had to get a different woman. <laughs> At that time, you just had one woman, one or two, maybe two. I think there were two of us for a long time. But yeah, she she wanted to move on, do something else. So I joined. And that was, we weren't really doing long form. I call it mid form mm -hmm. because it didn't have an assigned game like uh, like a short form game. But it was a little looser than long form where there wasn't any really mm -hmm. intention of creating a whole. It was loose scenes that were funny that sometimes referred to earlier scenes. Then in about 2000, I, I started going to the Chicago Improv Festival and met a lot of great teachers, took a lot of great classes, was inspired by the shows and invited uh, Joe Bill and Mark Sutton to come up to Minneapolis and do their show Basprov and teach workshops. And I found that really revelatory in terms of what I was thinking about improv and how a scene could be built, how a character could be built. Uh, really, when I look back, comedy sports is one of my starts, but the Chicago Improv Festival is another. This was sort of in the early days of the internet, so people didn't know each other or communicate with each other about improv the way we do now. So really the only way to meet improvisers from around the country and around the world was to go to the Chicago Improv Festival, physically go. And I did and I loved it and I learned so much and then I started performing there. Uh, there was one year when I, I think 2002, when I put in my duo to submit and Jonathan Pitts, who was the producer, called me and said, we don't want your duo to come, but do you have a solo show? 
<laughs> well, that's the worst conversation I ever had to have with someone. I had to tell my duo partner that, oh, they don't want us to come. Oh. They just want me. <laughs> Terrible. But uh, that's, uh, I had just started doing a solo show. And that was the growth of that. Uh, and then a few years later, we started Huge Theater. Mm -hmm. In terms of a, a training in long form improvisation, I spent some time in 2003, went to Chicago for six months, took classes at IO and the Annoyance just to put some more bones underneath what I was doing. Uh, I really, I've taken some classes in long form, but it's really funny that I co-founded a long form theater because my, my formal training leans more toward perhaps well no I guess my formal training is just not as rigorous as you would imagine I've never completed an entire program <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's interesting I I will go with you to to uh, the solo show because you uh, you do it and I I was um, curious anyway to ask you how it started but before that um, I still would like to stay, I asked my guests, uh, actually all of them, about improv epiphany. What was your, because as you mentioned, uh, inviting Joe Beale and uh, Mark Sutton to uh, Minneapolis was a big, for sure, big um, thing to see uh, their show and it's really special one. Uh, uh, so uh, for sure this influenced uh, uh, you a lot, but what was your like, Epiphany, which was like, you know, oh, this is it, or how, uh, you know, how you found some nice things which uh, led you to be better improviser. <laughs> ah, but improv in general. The minute I learned about it, I was like, yep, yep, this is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, this is what I've been waiting for. In terms of individual moments, uh, we took, we brought a. Uh, Susan Messing from Chicago came to Minneapolis and her workshop, I really like felt my bones <laughs> stepping up. It's interesting. There's been individual moments. I think those six months I spent in Chicago, when I look back at it, I did it. I didn't do it well. I didn't have enough money saved. I lived with my mother in the suburbs instead of in the city. So it wasn't a perfect adventure. Uh, but the lesson I took out of that was that uh, it's never too late. You have more time in long form, even though that should be obvious, mm -hmm. but you have more time in long form. You can build something beautiful. Um, individual moments uh, that have upped my game. I think uh, my, uh, my duo partner, Trish Barong from Kansas City and I, uh, did some work with Dave Rosowski, David Rosowski in Los Angeles and getting to work together just intensively with only one other student and spend that time really helped build in me um, an impulse to, to, uh, to be invested in the moment of improv and to spend the moment of improv. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, <laughs> we're in some moments right now uh, I don't know how much is in the national news, but Minneapolis is the city uh, at the epicenter of the search for social justice, the fight for social justice in the United States. Uh, we are, we're in the middle of the Minneapolis uprising because George Floyd was killed by police officers here. So it's too soon to say how that will change my improvisation, but it's really highlighted for me that it, it has to. Uh, we have to find a, a source of improvisation uh, where we can speak to speak to truth in a way uh, that doesn't camouflage it, uh, that that celebrates and finds joy in who we are, who everyone is, and brings everyone who uh, who could benefit from this art form or who has something to share from this art form into, into the art form. So that's a lot of what I'm thinking about at this exact second. And it's hard to think about other things. <laughs> yeah. You are in the epicenter of, of the events. Uh, yeah. Actually now that's true. Yeah. Um, I will, I will be back to that. Oh, uh, uh, just, just, uh, 
closing the subject of, of your, uh, your way and your, your learning process. Um, because you do it like now 20 something years, it's 20, I don't know, how many, 20? How many? 27? Yeah, in yeah. December maybe, yeah. 27 years, <laughs> this is really long. Um, what, what is challenging for you after 27 years of doing improv? <laughs> Well, I talked about that goal in the beginning of, of getting laughter from the audience. Uh, that has shifted for me. My relationship with the audience is different. I think of them more as collaborators. We're sharing space. We're sharing time together. And it's, it's less about delivering something to them than creating something with them. I also think more of my focus is in uh, the beauty of of group process, mm -hmm. what we can make together, what makes us each individually special. Uh, when I work with students, I teach, I think I teach a lot more improv now at this exact moment, obviously, I teach more than I perform. And in the shift to teaching, it became obvious to me in the last few years that each individual student has something to offer that is uniquely them. So a teacher's job is not to take individual people and make them like <laughs> make them into little clones or copies of yourself. Uh, I would rather find a way to to you know, give each possible person a chance to succeed in the kind of improv that makes sense for them. Like if each if each person is built for a purpose what is their purpose and what what habits can we strip away from them to make what they're doing even clearer how can we prepare them to do their best work that that for me is a shift um, to really look at each individual improviser not just talk about that idea of uh, I, I, my main focus has been you are enough to to tell each improviser that they're coming into this work with a, a grounding that they are sufficient. You, you have enough. You don't have to try to be like anyone else. You are, are the right raw material for what you need to create. So what can we do to help you create that with as much clarity, as much purpose, as much satisfaction, artistry, as is possible. That feels to me like the shift in my own attention over time. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, do you do you play in other languages? Because I, know I do. Spanish, but I sometimes I sometimes play in Spanish, uh, which is difficult because my Spanish is not perfect and it never will be. But there's something. I mean, I admire all of you who play in English. Uh, I, I have great empathy now that I've tried to play in Spanish. It's very interesting when you don't have the facility of language, when words do not come easily, it's fascinating to see what you rely on instead. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> what do you rely on? <laughs> For me, it's emotion mm -hmm. more than any other thing. I value emotion in all improv, but in in the United States, when you watch the improv, you you can see how much we value words, right? Like making fancy wordplay is super important to us. If you look at our favorite warm up games, almost every exercise that someone will show you and how to warm up for an improv show is something to do with words. So I've been interested in emotions as the basis of improv instead. When you take away my words and put me into a Spanish speaking improv set and I have to make good on that idea, I find it really fascinating. I don't understand what you said, but I can read what your emotion is. I can make an emotional reaction and assumption i might be wrong <laughs> I, I can only think of one yeah i can only think of one improv scene where i finished 
And I asked later, what was that scene about? And I was completely wrong. I was completely wrong in what I thought the scene was about, even though I was the main character of this scene, because I didn't know the nouns. <laughs> but uh, yeah, what emotion is never a lie, even when there's more than one emotion happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Um... I will be moving to to next uh, next chapter. Uh, sure. As you mentioned, you live now in epicenter of very very important place, uh, which uh, which we all know now because Minneapolis, as you said, was uh, now um, uh, a place where uh, where all the uh, events started, uh, with, uh, not with Black uh, Lives Matters because this started before, but with, with, uh, uh, death of, um, of, of Mr. Yeah, Floyd. George Floyd. George, yeah. George Floyd. So I wanted to ask you because, um, I, um, how to say that when I started to do improv, uh, I didn't found uh, so much, uh, let's say, talking and pressure on being politically correct, bringing, you know, talk about boundaries, about harassment, all this stuff. And I know that on your workshops, you use a lot of different um, introductions to your workshop, uh, you know, to check with people how they are, who they are, how they feel, and so on. So I wanted to ask you how this for you changed and uh, how this has evolved for you uh, since you started till now, because for me changed a lot because of my international contacts at the moment. Uh, but um, for you in States, when it's even more deep than we have it now in Europe. Yeah. When I started, of course, nobody was thinking about how to take care of each other and what boundaries were. We came away with the impression that yes and meant you could do whatever you want. You were just supposed to, people were supposed to say yes to you and it didn't matter. Uh, uh, it was, and then people who felt unsafe or weren't having fun just sort of uh, disappeared. I think the a lot of the reason why improv in the United States has been dominated by white young men is because those were the people who felt the most comfortable. Um, nothing happened that felt personal to them. Nothing happened that that uh, reminded them of how <laughs> how horrible the world outside is. Uh, they felt comfortable and everyone who felt uncomfortable was just sort of supposed to suck it up or go home. Like mm -hmm. I remember I, I, people expected women to just sort of like be game and the phrase, you know, being game for everything means everything is okay with you. Even if it's offensive, even if it's hurtful, you're supposed to go along with it and put up with it. Uh, and that proves that you're one of the guys, that you're a team player. That's how you show uh, that you're, and that you're part of the team. So the shift in the last few years has been to say, um, how, uh, I, like I think improv will die if it continues down that path. If we only hear from one set of voices, um, this art form will die. It needs to be a full reflection of humanity, of who's with us. And so many people out there have something important to say that they could say through improv. And it doesn't even have to be important. We could just see so many other slices of life if we allowed more lives to have a place to belong. So we started a class a few years at my theater a few years ago at Huge Theater called, we now call it Amplifying Voices. Mm -hmm. And it's just for women, non-binary, trans and queer students. Uh, people who felt like really out of place or pushed aside or talked over in standard and proud classes. And the work that's come out of that program is so interesting. It just looks different 
the topics they choose to illuminate through improv are different. It's funny in a different way. There, we're hearing, we're seeing up relationships that are fresh, right? Situations that are fresh that maybe we have not seen. It's not by any uh, by any stretch weaker. In a lot of ways, it's braver. It's it's cooler. It's more in touch with reality. And that was very inspiring to us as a possibility. Uh, at the same time, we're lucky that here in Minneapolis, uh, I think they're celebrating their fourth, third or fourth anniversary. There's an improv group called Blackout, which is all black improvisers performing together. And what's really funny is they wouldn't even have to do any political work. Their existence is political. Mm -hmm. It feels like to put together a group of black improvisers is inherently political. You're inherently going to hear feedback from people that you're doing something political. So what I really admire about uh, Blackout is that they kind of head straight at that and the work they do addresses what's on people's minds. They do a lot of shows where they ask members of the audience to write on a piece of paper, any topic, and then they just talk about these topics and do scenes inspired by them. And they're funny and fresh and brave. And we're getting to see scenes that are not like any scenes we've seen. We're experiencing more perspectives. And as a result, it's making the whole art form stronger. Mm -hmm. I think it's making everything we see better. And then, it's not like these affinity groups stay together. Once people feel strong, they go and start auditioning for other things. So then every show in the city is better and every cast is closer to reflecting what Minneapolis actually looks like in terms of makeups of age and race and, and physical ability and, and the sexual orientation, everything is better represented. And I, it's, really, it's really beautiful and it makes me hopeful for the future of the work. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what your question was. <laughs> I hope that was an answer. <laughs> My question was how it evolved to, you know, to working with students and workshops, because uh, I remember that uh, even in the international workshops, workshops, it wasn't mentioned at the beginning when I started. Uh, and then I found it that the, the American teachers who came to, to, to Poland or to Europe, they started to speak uh, loud, how they feel about themselves, how they want to treat students, how they, um, how they think about people in the group when they teach. Yeah, in that dis that discussion was really led in Minneapolis by a group called Fair Play Minnesota. That was a group of women that came together a few years ago when the Me Too movement began. They wrote a beautiful piece. Uh, discussing the inequality in Minneapolis improv, on stage, off stage, in classes, in shows, in rehearsals, just looking at the whole picture at the state of Minneapolis improv, what was happening uh, in terms of how women and non-binary and trans improvisers were being treated. And that was a, a really clear call to action for theaters and for individual performers. And then one of the documents they wrote after that was a, a list of how to do a boundaries discussion. They gave a really good sample of a discussion you could have at the beginning of a workshop to talk to students about what would make them feel safe. What's the best way to take care of you today here in this space? For example, right now in Minneapolis, and I don't know of how many places this is, but none of us really want to see a scene about police. None of us really want to see an improv scene about the police. It doesn't feel like a safe or fun thing to do a scene about. So we take that off the table mm -hmm. and then 
it's funny because we're all on Zoom now, but we also started talking about physical boundaries because a lot of women improvisers were discussing how often in a scene they were being touched in a way that they did not feel comfortable being touched. Mm -hmm. They wanted to have the control the agency to say how they would like to be touched in an improv scene. And they also wanted a tool, we call it a timeout. They wanted a tool for if a scene is making you uncomfortable, not in an improv sense, but in a human sense, if it's making you uncomfortable, can you stop that scene? Because the old advice was just to to keep going, to power through, even if it felt creepy, even if it felt disgusting, you were supposed to keep doing the scene. Mm -hmm. So Fair Play Minnesota introduced that ideology. And since then, in the last three years, we've, we've been refining it, uh, finding the best way. Uh, it's important to shift the focus and make it clear that it's not that, oh, Susan's really sensitive, so we can't do scenes about this. Blah. The idea is more, what can we do to make everyone here feel safe? What can we do to do the best possible work? You can do improv about anything, but there are certain topics that we should agree to. If we really wanted to do scenes about violence, then the four of us could get together. We could practice how to do those scenes really safely. Uh, we could have really open, honest discussions and plan to, for how we would make that a great experience for ourselves and the audience. But in the class, I don't think it's necessary to have that be a topic. We can, well, there's so much to improvise about that if there's a simple thing we can do to make someone comfortable, we should do it. Mm -hmm. So as you, as you run, uh, uh, you're co-founder of the theater and I also will be back to this subject, but, uh, but as, you, as you have this, uh, this theater and you run uh, courses, what's the policy? How does that look? Like people have like special place to report or how, how this whole process comes to, to your process of teaching people and in the theater with your teammates and, and people who work with you? Right. Uh, at the start of the class session, we do 10 week classes. And on the first day, all of the students sit together and we read from a student handbook that includes practical things like how to make a payment and also uh, philosophical things. And it includes our harassment policy, which has really clear steps of how to report. And at that same meeting, we demonstrate how to call a timeout in a scene and how to let your teacher know what, what topics are uncomfortable or unsafe for you. We just have a really open discussion about it and students can ask all the questions they want. Then they break into their individual groups. And one thing that's really important is to make sure that there's more than one path. Uh, they, if you feel comfortable talking to your teacher, the teaching assistant, the director of the program, if you'd rather write an anonymous note, mm -hmm. I want to make sure that all of those paths are available and that you make it really clear what those paths are. Because in the absence of instructions, people make, us, make assumptions that the, the uh, theater does not care mm -hmm. or that the theater knows something and doesn't care. Um, so it's really important to say out loud that there's lots of options in any way that you feel safe reporting. Sometimes people have talked to their old teacher. They don't feel safe talking to their current teacher, but they go talk to their old teacher and then their old teacher talks to me. And that's a path, whatever path people need, but to make it really clear to have it in writing, but also said out loud at the beginning so that people know you're doing it intentionally, you're doing it on purpose. Um, I think for us, I mean, we refine it every semester. We're figuring out the best way to do it mm -hmm. uh, is, is really important. We want people to know that improv is fun and that improv is gonna be a great time. So we don't like to load it at the beginning with, this, with an intense discussion. So maybe we'll do something fun that's non-verbal and non-contact non at the start so that people understand that, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
this is going to be a great time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's interesting for me that you have many ways to communicate that because sometimes where there is a one way that you have just like one teacher and you can report to this, but what happens if this is the teacher who harass <laughs> makes harassment, right? So then you need another way to, to avoid this person and go to, to whatever head of the team or, or, or the director of the theater or whatever. Oh, that's, that's interesting. I didn't know that. That's, uh, I think, uh, for our uh, um, audience will be also interesting because uh, it's, I think it's still not so common in every place. And as I said, it's probably... Um, now in america it's growing and this movement is growing but in europe uh it's pretty new i think it it, it comes and it's known but uh good to share it thank you for that um so i will do you hear uh, an, do you hear an echo when i talk no nope. okay i think it stopped now just for a second i was hearing an echo <laughs> anyway <laughs> no nope. nope. i i just hear you and myself <laughs> Um, Jill, so I will, I will uh, go to next, I will move uh, forward. Mm, I wanted to talk about your duos and uh, specifically uh, about one of the events uh, which you mentioned uh, once when we, uh, when we talked uh, some time ago. You, when you had 20th uh, anniversary uh, of your uh, doing Improv, you had a special event which was playing with your friends and uh, and uh, yeah teammates and friends who improvise play with how was it with twenty people or how was yeah it? i had, I did twenty duos in twelve hours wow <laughs> that's impressive yeah it was beautiful so how how, uh, how did it look like 12 hours so each duo was like uh, what half an hour 20 minutes yeah some were 20 minutes a couple were one hour there was a lunch break <laughs> my friend molly was like you're taking a lunch break don't skip the <laughs> yeah it was so fascinating mm -hmm. because i've known for a while that you improvisers adapt to the person that they're playing with and when you're playing with a different person every 20 minutes you're adapting every 20 minutes it was so fascinating to see that I don't improvise the same with every person I I try to adapt to be the perfect person for the perfect partner for the person I'm playing with and after that it became kind of a a mission of mine to create I created a workshop called being a dream partner so that people could really focus on if I'm playing with Monica what could I do to make Monica the happiest person what could I do to make this other improviser feel understood to uh, really lean into their strengths how can I highlight them how can I make the best use of what they love to do? It's a really interesting process. I wish everyone would get a chance to do it. Yeah, it's, uh, I, but tell me what was most uh, challenging in that project and how quickly you could adjust because it's not like, okay, next person, I know it's different. It's, I'm playing different. You, especially when you don't play with these people every day. So when you had this experience, what was this moment? And you know, like, how <gasps> <did> you <feel? laughs> yeah, I, I tried to, I found an improviser who was born the month I auditioned for comedy sports. So I auditioned for comedy sports in November 1993. And my friend was born in November 1993. And when we performed together, it was very funny because obviously we don't have a lot of references in common. We don't, have, not just pop culture references, but how we spend our days, what we think about, what we're worried about is very different because we're at these, we're 20 years apart in terms of stage of life. I think she was just applying for colleges at that time. Like that's a different world than somebody who's 42 years old, 41 years old. 
it was very interesting to me. I think that was the hardest one. Mm -hmm. uh, the easiest one was my friend Trish Barang from Kansas City. She watched all of the duos and then we were the last duo. And it was very funny because we were both so tired and just kind of melted puddles of human. And there was no artifice. You could only say the honest truth. You couldn't create anything. And there was a moment in the improv set where I said, you're my best friend. And I meant it as a character. But as the words left my mouth, I realized it was the truth for me. And she said, you're my best friend. And that's the actual moment when we realized in character, but not as a character, that we were best friends. <laughs> and we just sort of held on to each other and laughed because it was so funny to be reduced to just being able to say and notice what was true. <laughs> But it really must have been uh, uh, tiring because like 12 hours with just yeah. like, oh my God. But it was during the day, like from morning till late uh, evening? Or yeah, I think we started at 7 a.m. and finished at 7 p.m. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> the whole day. Yeah. <laughs> oh, crazy. Um, but talking about duos, I wanted to ask you about um, uh, you have a duo. You have you played a few duos with with different people. It's obviously uh, true. But you have a duo with Jobil, and there is something you play which is quite interesting. And I think maybe it comes from your solo show. But uh, I wanted to talk about it because not everyone plays it. That's not so common, I think, playing a ghost scenes at the beginning. Ah, yeah. Uh, that technique comes from Joe. Joe Bill from Chicago uh, has a form called scramble that he teaches. And in scramble, he, uh, he has them start a scene as if another character is there. So you're mm -hmm. starting a scene talking to the space where my character would be. I honestly don't know if he calls it a ghost scene. I do because that makes it make sense to me. But you're talking to the space where your partner would be and then that person can fill in that space. Mm -hmm. It's so fascinating because you have a lot of information already about your character from the way that your partner was talking to you before you were there. It's also nice because then the scene is already started. It's not, you're not entering the scene, hi, I'm here. You already have been in the scene and you're making your best assumptions about who you are and, and what's going on based on what, how your partner has been reacting to you and interacting with you before you were there. It's such a great process. It's, I think it's a beautiful way to build a scene. So just to explain for people, because you started the scene with your show doing with uh, Jobil, two of you are playing the ghost scenes and then you join each other to those two scenes. So there are two parallel scenes where you play together, right? Is, is yeah, good? it's funny that you explained with your fingers because we always do that before the show. Because otherwise we'll forget. We start two scenes as if the other person is there. Then we switch and we're, the, we're filling in the ghost space. Then we finish this scene and then we finish this scene. We're never going back. The scene continues the whole time. <laughs> uh, but the, and then we run around and do another, a third scene uh, that does not have a ghost start. Mm -hmm. uh, but leaving the option to hop back to those other scenes whenever we feel like. That's our format, Scram. And you can tell now that it's named because it's a small version of Scramble, his bigger mm -hmm. form. <laughs> But I can't remember, is these two characters in both uh, scenes, they are the same characters, but the, the, or there are four characters? No, no, there's four characters in those opening 
scenes. That's true. That's really interesting because uh, not I, I don't know if I've seen that uh, except your show. Uh, I didn't have chains. Okay, so from duos, let's go to your show, uh, which is a solo show, which is uh, you mentioned uh, drum machine. Yeah. So, uh, you know a little bit where it comes from. It comes from you being invited to uh, Chicago <laughs> Festival. <laughs> uh, it's a musical. So where the name comes from and how did you develop the, the whole thing? Oh, it's so, can you hear me okay? Yeah, a bit, a bit, it's a bit, uh, yeah, I thought I think it's, it's less, but... Uh, yeah, I had to plug in my computer for battery. Um, I'll come closer. <laughs> um, uh, I, I had seen Andy Ettinger's solo show, and I had seen Lisa Jolly's solo show, and I had uh, the idea. Um, I could increase my volume. I'll increase my volume and start over. <laughs> Um, oh, maybe that's too loud now. <laughs> it's better. Yeah, yeah, it's much better. better? Okay. Uh, I had seen Lisa Jolly and Andy Ettinger do solo improv. And then I honestly woke up one morning and I thought there should be a show called Drum Machine. So I got out of bed and I walked down the street. There was a music store at the end of my street. And I said, I would like to buy a drum machine. And the clerk said, what kind? And I said, I have no idea what is a drum machine. <laughs> and he found the perfect drum machine, sold it to me. Because I wanted to do musical improv without an accompanist, uh, without a musician. And a drum machine is just a machine that makes beats for you. And so I, I, I played with it. And I would do a song, I would get a number from the audience between like one and 99 and put that number into the drum machine and it would play some random beat and I would change the tempo and sing a song. I was invited by my friend, uh, Melissa Birch to do a cabaret mm -hmm. and three performances in a cabaret. And <laughs> so I, I never practiced solo improv standing up. I was just in bed giggling with the amp next to my head. Uh, and then I finally did the show at the cabaret five minutes. And then I was like, good night. And I ran away. I did sort of, I interviewed a member of the audience and re replayed their life with songs in it as if it were a musical. And that was the start of it. The show grew from that humble, small five minute beginning. And now it's sort of a full length musical. I combine an interview with an audience member with a historical period suggested by the audience and weave a musical based on that idea. And now I love using a, a musical accompaniment, accompanying it, a musician. <laughs> it's so much better with a live musician. A drum machine is so limited. And what I found is every city I go to, I just ask, I say to them, do you have a local musician who could play with me? And they find somebody. And so far I have not been burned. So far it's always been someone amazing and talented. And the show we do together is just a really cool collaboration that I couldn't have done by myself. I love that element of collaborating with a musician. Mm -hmm. So what's, because you have just one kind of suggestion, which is a, a period of time, as far as I remember, and then you talk to the audience, me audience member. So what's the period of time, which is always or most of the time coming? <laughs> like middle age or? <laughs> the French Revolution. Everybody wants to say the French Revolution. Uh -huh. uh, other ones, uh, the French Revolution, and then, uh, gosh, what else comes up all the time? The American Revolution, of course. <laughs> um, Renaissance, mm -hmm. and then people say Renaissance, but they don't really know more. Like you say, which Renaissance? And they, <laughs> and they're like, oh. 
which makes me think they're assuming the Italian Renaissance. So I lean toward, if they don't know that there's more than one Renaissance, I go. <laughs> But did you did you prepare like did you study a bit uh, like to know what kind of uh, things can pop up at just to to learn or you just made it up and then you just go for it as you hear it? Well, history is so fascinating, and I don't know if everyone like I I don't remember everything about history. I certainly one time a reviewer said that they said Bernard cannot be stumped on any historical period. And I was like, really? You did not hear me ask the audience for details about the historical period? Yeah. But it doesn't matter to me that I know everything. Yeah, of but course. when you hear a historical period, little fragments of what you know about it are still in your mind. Like mm -hmm. for example, whenever someone asks me to do uh, like the the Grecian Wars between Sparta and Athens, the only fact that really stands out is that they worked in a phalanx, which is when the, the armies would stand shield to shield and make it sort of a point so that no one could break through that. And I have no idea why that is so riveting to me, that one fact. Um, or if you ask me about the Industrial Revolution, I always think about interchangeable parts, which is the idea that when you build a gun or if you build a toaster, each of the parts of that toaster should fit into another toaster or another gun so that you can mass manufacture them. And that was a new idea. So that one little piece stuck in my head or individual people. Like, I don't remember everyone uh, from the Alamo, but I remember Davy Crockett, right? What's funny is you don't even have to be right because the audience is probably gonna have fun ha with how wrong you are too. There have been times when the audience suggested something that I had no idea and I, I asked them about that. Uh, the one I think of the most is the Bayou Tapestries. Do you know what they are? Nope. I don't know what they are. And I, so I asked the audience member to explain them. It turns out they, they, they document the, the battle in France in which King Harold lost an eye. This beautiful story, beautiful, this amazing story. And what was fun about that is then, because the audience member explained it to me, everyone in the room knew exactly what I knew. <laughs> so they knew everything that I made up that was not true. And they knew everything that was true. And they got to laugh when I brought up something that was true. But they also laughed when it was clear that I was just guessing. So it doesn't matter if I know or not. We have a good time either way. And sometimes, because I also interview an audience member, sometimes their story has so many interesting ideas and themes that the piece I do has almost nothing to do with the history and has all to do with a family relationship or maybe uh, a coworker relationship that was clear in the story that the person told. I tend to lean for inspiration on whatever sparked me the most. If the interview is filled with beautiful, beautiful thoughts and beautiful connections and ideas, I go that way. If the historical period is really inspiring, I go that way. And I just look for how they blend together. I throw all the ideas up in the air and sort of tie them together as they come down. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So how uh, solo work uh, improved your work as an improviser? Because it's also, you know, I, I heard from some of my friends like training solo, how, you know, it's anyway difficult to play solo uh, show, but to train solo, do something at home and whatever. So how this, this process of doing solo shows improved you as an improviser? <laughs> Because it's a solo musical, I've spent a lot of time just training myself in how to improvise songs. 
that's a really easy thing that you can do alone. <laughs> There's a couple of great books, like Nancy Howland Walker wrote a book called Instant Songwriting. And what's nice about it is it comes with music that you can practice. So you can just have the opportunity to just make up songs all day long uh, or just practice rhyming all day long. And that mm -hmm. really helped me build the structure of what I was doing. And then I think um, for myself, practicing switching characters, like I would say that 80% of the improv solo shows that I see that person plays more than one character. So how are you, you have to make a decision. How are you as one person going to represent more than one person? And you get to choose what that looks like, how it will be accomplished. And then what can you do to make it really clear for the audience that that is what is happening? There's a bunch of different ways to accomplish that goal. And that's something you can really clean up and make look great and make really clear for the audience. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how you practice it. Then just trying it out. <laughs> I think that's the scariest part. You have to sort of try it somewhere because the best coach is the piece itself. You do mm -hmm. the show or at least five minutes of the show and it's really clear afterwards how you need to stretch next. Yeah. How uh, did it influence your uh, storytelling? Because you tell the story as a one person, so you're responsible for the whole thing? I think so. Yeah, I think it, it helps. When you improvise as a group, it's possible to relax and not be <laughs> fully engaged. We want to think that we're fully engaged. But if there's eight of us on stage, there might be a moment when I'm not responsible for moving the story. Mm -hmm. but when you're alone or in a duo, you're responsible all of the time for moving the story. And it really trains you in how to be moving a story and never sitting back, never putting your weight in your heels ever. <laughs> now, a problem is when you go back to group work, you have to be careful that you're not rolling over other people, <laughs> that you're leaving space for other people's contributions and going along with other people. That It always feels funny to me to do a solo show and a group show in the same evening. Because <laughs> I'm a little too wrong. <laughs> so is it challenging then just to, to, you have to focus then more on that? Yeah, it feels really, especially if I do the solo show first and then we do the group show, the group show feels so loud. <laughs> it's just like, what? There's so much happening. And it feels harder to, mm -hmm. to take all of the ideas together. Uh, when you're alone, it's really clear who's responsible. It's always, it's always you. But is a lie because the audience is with you and the technician is with you and in my case the musician is with me so the entire piece is not really a solo piece but in terms of storytelling responsibility it falls uh -huh. on you <laughs> good question <laughs> What, what, so what was what what is the be the biggest thing you you got out of it like uh, like the, the skill of uh, the switching characters was that 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 one the biggest skill um was knowing that i'm okay by myself i um, think a lot of improvisers panic if they're the first one on stage and they look around to see if anyone else is going to come out mm -hmm. but learning that i'm fine like I can be on stage alone and that's fine was the most important lesson. It's okay, the audience is not gonna get up and leave because <laughs> they're waiting for someone else to come. You have a responsibility when you do solo improv to make sure the audience understands that this is a choice 
It's not something bad that happened to you. It's not that the rest of your troop forgot to come. Um, you need to communicate with them that you're okay as a solo improviser and that we're gonna have a good time and that this isn't a punishment for you. You're not in solitary confinement. You meant to do a solo show. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a great lesson to learn, to communicate with the audience with your energy, that this is what is supposed to happen, it is a beautiful improv skill. Mm -hmm. So how was, how was at the beginning you were like, did you have a like stress and you know, fear before going to this, like this first show and, and especially the Chicago festival, a huge, one of the biggest, the longest running festival and so on. And how is it like now? Where is this level of stress now? It's, it's, it's like, okay, I'm fine with that or a little bit, or how do you feel? How was it and how is it? It's, it's a journey always, isn't it? To how you can channel uh, the energy you have pre-show. Is it going to be negative or is it going to be positive? Like anxiety, just is excitement that hasn't flipped over to excitement yet. So if you're feeling anxious, you're probably pretty close to being excited. You just have doubt. <laughs> so I think now, because I have less doubt, I'm able to have more excitement, but it's still the same source of energy. The, the brain chemicals firing inside of you to, t to tell you that you're alive and you're about to do something that is alive, that is, that is very vibrant and your energy is going to be completely invested in this project for the next however long. Um, I still sometimes get nervous, but it's more when I don't think that the the audience is with me. To be honest, it's mostly for corporate shows. Uh, with comedy and sports, we perform for a lot of corporations. And sometimes the audience did not choose to be there. Their boss said they had to come to the show, <laughs> which is a horrible feeling. Like, I'm going to do a show, and you did not make the decision to watch it. You didn't buy a ticket because you thought it would be fun. You're sitting here because after this, they're gonna give away prizes. So you wanna stay and get, your, get a prize. <laughs> so that's when I'm nervous now, when I don't feel like we're all here to have a good time. So do you have like any special way of dealing with this? Like, I don't know, briefing or I don't know, what's, what's your way to, to get over the fear? Yeah, when I'm nervous about the audience, I try to, this is so silly, I try to convert them from a them into an us. Like, mm -hmm. how soon can it be we are having this experience as opposed to I am doing a show for a them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So before the show, I try to have some kind of shared moment with an audience member like I love, <laughs> I love going to the women's bathroom at corporate events because there's always a conversation in there like, oh, pretty hot out, right? Or like, hey, these are nice towels. <laughs> <laughs> Just something human. Or if we're all sharing food, like having dinner, like, oh, wow, um, Parmesan. <laughs> to do something. Like so you interact with these people? You try to interact with them? Just, just Somehow, get... in some small way, with at least one other person mm -hmm. to have a moment that makes, that puts us on the same side. Because the stage is often so opposite the audience, right? We're here, you're over there. Sometimes there's an a, a orchestra pit, so I can't get across to you. Uh, to spend some time being on the same side mm -hmm. helps me feel better. Wow, interesting. <laughs> I didn't know that before. <laughs> ah, yay. Um, so, um, 
still uh, still have a few questions. So uh, you come to to Europe uh, pretty a lot. Uh, last I don't know eight ten years I don't know how long, and you also perform and um, travel in states. How do you find um, Europe as a pretty new, still not new because we have improv in Europe since 30, sometimes 40 years uh, in some places like Germany or, uh, or Holland. But um, how is Europe different for you than United States? Right. It's so funny because if you're an improviser in the United States, I can probably trace back your pedigree. Like, I know where you came from. You probably came from Spolin or uh, Del Close, or uh, you, you might have done some comedy sports or a copy of comedy sports. I can probably find out, I probably know your influences. Mm -hmm. So when I got to Europe, it was really interesting because I don't know the influences. Even if you say, like most people come from a, some sort of a theater sports or match expansion, like even if theater sports and match were the two hubs, the way different countries, or I should say different cities, the way different cities have run with that, to me feels intimately connected to what other art exists there. Mm -hmm. um, often it's theater, like what kind of theater is there? Or it's clown. Is there a clown tradition? You see that a lot in France, for example, where the French improvisers have a connection with their bodies and with relating to humor that is closer to clown than to Del Close. <laughs> <laughs> so much closer to clown than to Del Close, um, I, which is so fascinating to me because I don't know these traditions. I was so excited to go to Romania because I don't know anything about Romanian theater tradition um, and what people, and, and then culturally, where people come from. Romania is the first place I've ever been to in the world where how are you is not a fake question. In the United States, when someone says, how are you? You say, I'm fine on the worst day of your life. <laughs> on the worst day of your life, you might say, I'm okay. <laughs> it's not a real question. But I got to Romania and when you say, how are you? People answer for real. They say how they really are with no expectation that you will fix it. They just want to keep you engaged with how they really are. Um, I'm sorry, my alarm went off. Of all the things to not silence, um, they just want to, yeah. Um, that's bad. How do you turn it off? How do you turn it off? Um, ah. um, yeah, they, they want to know how you are for real. And when I look at that, I think um, it, it spills over into their improv in terms of uh, they're willing to do things that are very honest. Um, it's not, not in the sense that it's always biographical or autobiographical, but there's a root, um, a root in true experience and in heart, heartfelt experience that plays out in the improv, I mean, and of course, I have not met every improviser in Romania, but it's a trend I saw among the, the improvisers and students that I met that's tied to the cultural history, but also, I believe, the theater history. But wouldn't this be fun to explore, like really research the, the tradition of improv and where it comes from, and if it's coming from two different places, uh, there are a lot of people who heard about improv from a book or a, one teacher from the United States. So they're doing their best copy, but it's not a copy because it has to have the thumbprint or the imprint of the place and of the people who are doing it. Mm -hmm. 
This reminds me your quote of uh, you are your own school of improv. <laughs> right. You are your own school of improv. So every teacher you've ever had influenced you. Everyone uh, led you to be who you are today. And your own ideas, your own background. Like I read lots of romance novels as a teenager. And I can feel that sort of storytelling present in my own work. Because that formed how my brain paths, makes a path through mm -hmm. a story. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> um, I'm so happy that we talked about these festivals, but because you are so uh, like almost not, not maybe not every year, but every two years for sure you are back to to, to Europe, right? Uh, quite often. Who or knows some... now? <laughs> <laughs> now, it's, now it's now nobody yeah, knows. Time of COVID. Yeah. Yeah. We can um, as we mentioned, your quote. This quote it comes from this beautiful little book. Oh, it's like that. <laughs> This is a cute book of improv by uh, Jill Bernard, which is the 10th, 10th anniversary already. My God. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, this book because you write there like kind of essays, which is uh, because the book is, is uh, like, like it's visible. It's tiny. It has nice drawings inside. Uh, but um, this book is mentioned by many people and has some exercises and has some stuff which is already known widely. Um, what I wanted to ask you, because we have, um, you know, we have exercises which come from Viola or from Keith or they were later made by uh, some other teachers. Uh, and you are mentioned pretty a lot of times with one of your exercises, which is, uh, I think it's in this book as well. It's called a loser bo uh, ball. And could you explain, first of all, what the exercise is and why the exercise is, was made for and what made you to, to develop that? Ah, uh, uh, loser ball has only two rules. Rule number one, you cannot catch the ball. Rule number two, you must be unbelievably supportive of your friend's inability to catch the ball. So you'll be like, Jill, and you'll throw me the ball. I'll miss it. It will bounce off. It will roll past, something like that. Nobody is sad. Nobody's like, oh, everyone says something. Everyone's cheering for you and everyone finds something good in what you did. So they're like, nice hands or like good hustle, like a supportive football mom or soccer mom, a soccer parent. And the reason we play it, there's so many reasons and we keep discovering new ones. But the reason is uh, when we go into improv, we should be able to, to lose. Uh, we should be able to not feel like we have to do it perfectly. Doing improv perfectly and not making any mistakes leads to very small, very uncreative work. Um, mm -hmm. Within the boundaries of taking good care of each other, we should feel free to take, to take up space and to make, take chances and try things that might not work. So we, we, we play the game. It feels great because for many people, it's the first time that anyone's been supportive of them when they did not succeed. People mm -hmm. tell me that. Though. Like, it's a really weird feeling when you messed up and everyone's like, yay, great job, Monica. For a lot of people, that's a new experience. And so we, and also, so there's a part of it that's important about finding the good in what your partner did. I think a lot of times we judge our scene partners, even if we're trying not to, like your scene partner makes a choice and you go, ugh, because mm -hmm. it wasn't what you wanted. But if you wanted something specific from your scene partner, you should write a script and do sketch comedy. That's a whole other discipline. But if you're truly ready for anything, maybe your partner did not do what you expected, but it was something else something cool that they did instead, that there was something valuable in what they offered, even though it had nothing to do with what you expected 
or or plan, haha, <laughs> that's on you for planning your improv. I, I think the other thing is uh, is having the the pressure off of yourself to always do things correctly. A lot of people I meet in class are perfectionists. Uh, that's why they want to take an improv class to get better, right? And to tell them that uh, you can be supportive of yourself even if it didn't come out exactly like you hoped it would. I tell people that I don't, I don't ever have a bad improv show because mm -hmm. at the worst, at worst, I got to spend 20 minutes making shit up with my friends. I got to spend 20 minutes having a good time with my friends. And how could that be bad at its root? Even if the audience hated it, even if we made mistakes, even if it wasn't our best, at least we were together sharing an experience. Yeah, that's true. And I think it's also in the book. Uh, I wanted to mention one more thing, which is here, which is called... Uh, Vapapo! Vapapo! Vapapo is, is a way of doing um, exercises for building a character. Uh, and there is a small joke with the name. So if you just would just like quickly <laughs> mention, we don't have to explain everything. It's just like, how did you come out with that? It's and funny that what you were talking about with, we don't know where exercises come from anymore. This Vapapo is the idea that comes back to me the most where people do not know that I am the source. <laughs> Like they learned it at their improv class and they're like, have you heard of this thing for Papa? I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, I didn't invent it. I, I compiled it. It's, uh, it's a toolkit for creating characters that I collected from different theater and improv teachers. Uh, the Papa is not a real word. It, it stands for voice, attitude, posture, animal, prop and obsession. And the idea is if you pick one of those six things, it's a really quick basis for a character. You can start from there and move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if I just uh, change my physicality a little bit, maybe I raise my shoulders up, I start to already feel like a different person. And then I'm playing a different character and all of the other elements of that character come along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And uh, coming back to the boundaries and this stuff, like being aware of things. Also, now I think a big, um, uh, how to say, influence that people started to mention their teachers and where they learned exercises. So I hear more and more that, you know, this is from Jill Bernard. This is from Keith Johnston. I learned that from this person or from Randy Dixon or from Patty Stice or from this and this person because it's important and on, and on this way, uh, people create also new stuff and they, and they, and, and sometimes they, this stuff is not in the books, like your Vapapo. So um, I also wanted to mention, because I know uh, Vapapo is quite popular. So if somebody watches this, I want people to know that it's your, <laughs> <laughs> no, your yeah, set. I, your set. Time, uh, the, I love that the idea gets around. I think the only time I was ever nervous about it is I ran into a person who was teaching their students that you have to do all of those things. But like you have to have a voice and an attitude and a posture. And a, no, I was like, no, the idea is to make it simpler for yourself. Can you pick just one thing, one small, small thing? And that's the basis so that all of the rest of your energy is available to do everything else that we have to do in improv. Jill, before I go to the very, very last, let's say, um, subject, I wanted to ask you about exercises. What's your favorite uh, exercise of yours or your favorite thing you like to teach? What's your, what makes you exciting when, when, you, when, you come, when it comes to one, this one workshop, which is the most exciting one? <laughs> Or exercise. Yeah, I don't know how every improv teacher builds their class, but every class I teach has a centerpiece, an extra, a big exercise, 
near the end that is so good that's like the exercise and everything else is to lead you in that direction um, so it would depend on the topic but i think my favorite of all of them maybe is uh is a very simple exercise um, you and i do a two-person scene where i do not speak and you do all the speaking. So I'm a real character. I'm physically present. I call the exercise two people, one silent, because it's a two person scene, but I don't say anything. Mm -hmm. um, and then I coach in the middle of it for to have a, a pause where both people are silent and no one is speaking. And there's just silence in the scene. Um, for sometimes it's hard for the silent person because many of us want to help. So like our idea of help is to do a lot, like mm -hmm. you have to tell that person, just relax, be present, but you, it's just very light acting. You're not doing a lot. And what I love about the exercise is it turns out that anyone can drive a scene Sometimes I meet an improv team and they think they're made up of half strong improvisers and half support, support improvisers. And this exercise proves that that is not at all true. Any of us can be the main character and any of us can be a supporting character. So we do it with the whole group and each person rotates through and does both of those tasks. Either they're the one speaking or they're the one who's completely silent. And I, I let the person who's speaking choose the scene setup and set the chairs and set the situation so that it truly feels like their scene. And I like to say, this is the scene you would do if no one screwed it up for you, right? <laughs> like what's the scene you would do if you didn't feel like you had to fit into what your troupe was doing or you didn't have to fit in to what the audience expected? What is the scene you would choose out of any possible scene? Uh, that's a lesson. We, I've had people do this exercise who have one week of improv experience and they've done beautifully. It only lasts a minute anybody can drive a scene for a minute with another human being there. And it turns out the person who's silent is not doing nothing. They're providing all kinds of uh, context and emotional validity and support. And we as a viewer are looking at that silent person and sort of writing emotions and thoughts onto them it's really a lovely exercise and it really uh, helps each of us see what what each of us individually has to bring to the table mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah thank you I'm excited about it um, so my last very last question because we talk already over yeah, uh, time flies time flies um, so uh, because you live in Minneapolis, <clears throat> tell me, because you have a, you, you are co-owner, co-founder of the theater, which is called Huge. Uh, and um, I would like to ask you, first of all, how old it is and, you know, how, how does that work? How many classes, people working in it, uh, you know, how, how the community grows around it? And if this is the only place in Minneapolis, or as you mentioned, I think that there's a bit more of improv, uh, but I don't know if there are theaters or places or how yeah. does it look? We started, uh, we opened the theater in almost 10 years ago, now or nine years ago. And the reason we did is because it, there were no long form theaters. At the time there were a lot of strong, short form theaters. And there's another theater called the Brave New Workshop that opened in 1958. And they mm -hmm. do sketch comedy followed by improv. But there was no place just for long form improv. And we were doing shows at rented theaters around town. There were five of us. And we just had a sense that there was enough independent long form and long form students that we could set up a theater 
just for more scenic improv. Not the games that you saw on Whose Line or at theater sports or comedy sports. Could we dedicate a space to more scenic work or narrative work? So we opened the theater, we founded a nonprofit and found a space. I love listing it off like it was easy. <laughs> like each of these steps was, was an ordeal. But we opened a space. Our first class had seven students and they were in, uh, we hadn't built the theater yet. So it was just a construction zone. And we had to say, please don't touch that pile of boards with nails sticking out of them. <laughs> um, please don't touch that pile of broken glass. But now um, in our winter semester, we had over 250 students. Uh, we have a, about 24 teaching teachers and teaching assistants. Mm -hmm. uh, we run shows. We used to before COVID. Uh, we had shows, you know, six nights a week. Uh, classes, so many classes. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens when we reopen. But that's yeah, that was the dream, to become a resource, so that there could be more long form improv in the cities to make a like a richer scene here and it really has worked if you think about it we've trained hundreds of people and people more and more know what improvisation is when we started uh, most people in minneapolis did not know about improvisation and that's probably still true <laughs> but every year more and more people have heard of it or participated in it um, or been part of it in their own way, which is super exciting. So how many seats the theater has? A hundred. Like, yeah, hundred. Yeah, we didn't want it to be too big. <laughs> yeah, and spaces then has to be bigger. So I, I understand that now it's a, of course, tough time, but do you teach like online classes and uh, did you switch to Zoom and... Yeah. Uh, We'll have to put some more up. Uh, we did some earlier in the spring and summer, and now this weekend is the Twin Cities Improv Festival and Black and Funny Improv Festival. So we don't have any online classes uh, that are multiple weeks at this second, but I bet we will. I'm gonna have to put up, I'll ask the teachers again. At the beginning, a lot of the teachers were nervous. They were like, oh, how do you teach a class online? And I think now we have enough evidence that it works that more people will be like, sure, I'll try. <laughs> I'll give it a shot. <laughs> Improv has changed now since this few months when we all sitting online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And be because of that, I also have this beautiful chance to talk to you and yeah. had great one and a half hour uh, of chatting. <laughs> Jill, thank you so much. It was really nice and insightful and great. And I, I really enjoy uh, our talk. Uh, I learned a lot uh, and I learned new things about you, which I didn't know, which is always great to have a bit more time. Thank you so much. Isn't that nice to learn more? Uh, we will uh, we will play a scene which is based on the exercise you explained during yeah. our talk. Margaret, you did yesterday the best, the most delicious birthday cake for my daughter. And I think you deserved a higher salary. Absolutely. I know you're surprised. I know I didn't give you any extra money since you started to work here. But I, I think you just you do so much for my family. I know you're speechless, but listen, if if a hundred dollar a month is not enough, I give you more. Okay. Uh, I I want you to be really happy with 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 this decision, and 
What about 150? Not, e not enough. Listen. How about I give you $200 a month more and as a compensation of the last seven years, I buy you a brand new car, which you will be able to come to, to work every day by. Am I? Can, can I do that? Will you accept that offer? That's... Receive! <laughs> <laughs> 